Hey folks, welcome back once again to Indaba Africa. This is Chris on YouTube right here in central Pennsylvania. And today, another special feature for those who were able to tune in a short while ago to Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. It was brilliant, was it not? If you missed it, <laughs> go back and watch the replay because it was fantastic. It was epic. Quite a conversation with Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. I really enjoyed it. And today I have a special treat for you. Um, uh, having been a voter since the age of 18, I voted in every single election in my adult life despite the fact that I was denied my franchise the first time in a primary, rushed up to the courthouse and walked in and screamed, I've been denied my franchise. I did a provisional ballot, so I know about how those things work since 1983. But having been a voter my entire life, I have never had a conversation with my elected representative, never. And here we are today. We're gonna to have a, a conversation with my elected representative, uh, this is uh, Dawn Kiefer. She's a current state representative for the 92nd District of Pennsylvania. She's also been a small businesswoman and a uh, parent. Well, not have been a parent. She is a parent and a taxpayer like uh, I am as well. So the district that, that we're in uh, comprises uh, parts of York County, uh, including townships, Carroll, Fairview, Flank. And anyway, most of you overseas don't really care about that. Just want to hear about uh, that she's a conservative uh, Republican. And we're going to talk to her a little bit and see if uh, tease out if she's a Tea Party kind of supporter. Uh, you know that I'm a Tea Party supporter for the most part. Anyway, folks, I'm going to bring her in now. So uh, Representative, uh, State Representative Don Kiefer, welcome to the program. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Uh, I'm well, I tell you, I just got back from Wyoming. That's God's country out there. I mean, it's like, uh, it's, it's conservative libertarian heaven out there. Right. Pretty vast out there as well. We were out there, I think three years ago, we went cross country with the kids and, uh, loved Wyoming devil's tower. We spent almost a full day there. Now devil's tower is amazing. I, I like the native American, uh, story about how a bear tried to climb it. Those are the claw marks. That's classic. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, of course, I wasn't far from Yellowstone and Grand Teton. I was just below that in the Wind River Range. And we had quite an adventure out there. The, uh, the first night we were supposed to go out, uh, I was with, um, with uh, special, Fo special Operations Forces veterans. It was kind of a retreat uh, to help transition to civilian life. Although some people have been out for some time, but still that transition can take many years for some veterans, particularly those who've had trauma or PTSD or traumatic brain injury. But I was with uh, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, and a whole host of other folks. It was quite an interesting thing. But the first night we went out, there was this massive storm, so they decided it was good prudence to not go out. And what happened is tens of thousands of trees were felled. And we actually ran into a couple that had been in the woods that night. They were terrified because trees were falling all around them. It was pitch dark. They couldn't see anything. They couldn't leave. They might have been killed by a tree. So I imagine if we take a group of a dozen people out there and the trees started falling us on, it would not have been a good scene. So yeah. anyway, well, let's let's get right to it. Um, I've introduced you a little bit, but could you tell folks a little bit more about yourself? Um, uh, you, you, you're a small businesswoman and um, you're a parent and a taxpayer. But tell us a little bit more about about yourself. So I'm originally from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. I married my high school sweetheart. Um, I went to school at George Mason University, so right outside of uh, DC, Fairfax, Virginia, and um, come from a working class family. So I have always worked all my life. Uh, I have a lot of small business owners in my family and um, have three kids uh, from the ages of 11 to 18. So my uh, oldest just graduated and she's waiting to go into the um, Air National Guard. And uh, so I ran on small business issues and uh, regulatory reform. That was my big frustration. Uh, my business was a consulting firm personally. I did, I worked with uh, trade associations. I worked with uh, different businesses, railroads, uh, helping them navigate um, local regulatory issues. So it was uh, gauntlet in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have, I think it's something close to 3,000 different municipalities. So try to do business in Pennsylvania and it, it can be a nightmare. So helping them navigate that. And my husband has a, he's a retired state police officer, but he has had a custom motorcycle business for 25 years. And um, that was really my impetus of running was getting frustrated with all the regulations we seem to stumble across every single day that I just thought, how does the average person do this who doesn't know anything about government? No, it's absolutely insane. Uh, you know, it's I always find it fascinating when I see members of Congress run for re-election. Well, I sponsored 27 bills and I'm thinking you've just taken 27 opportunities to deprive me of my freedom. And you're proud of that. <laughs> right. And we're seeing it right now. That's what I keep saying right now. So uh, people have their heads down. Us business owners have had our heads down. They haven't been engaged. Right. And every time you turn around, there's a trade association that's saying, oh, we should license this. You should make everybody have a permit to do this. And uh, everybody should have to work this way or that way. And we've all conceded because as small business owners, it takes a lot 
would cost me more time and money to fight this stuff than it would to actually just comply. And that's what we do. So now that we've gotten all these permits and we're licensing and the fees and the permitting, they can take it from us. And now they have impacted our livelihood in Pennsylvania. We, I mean, it is very difficult to work here in Pennsylvania. So um, I think that people are really becoming aware of just how intrusive government's gotten in our lives, but we're not blameless in this whole situation. So everybody's got to be engaged. And I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not your one, that, your person that's going to say, uh, be, I, I uh, introduced and passed this bill or that bill or that, you know, half of my job is stopping this stuff. Well, I, that's uh, you. Okay, I'll 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 I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. It's uh, probably not a big secret, but uh, you've got my vote in November. <laughs> <laughs> so, but seriously, uh, you know, it's uh, it's actually because um, as a political scientist, as a historian, retired military officer, I've often chuckled when I hear uh, legislators at the state, but especially the national level, and also chief executives like the president and governors talk about how they are doing this for the economy and they're going to do this and. And the reality is, if you understand uh, macroeconomics, the, the reality is that a president or a governor can destroy an economy almost overnight with capricious uh, legislation, executive action. But building an economy rarely is something that can be done overnight. And I'll give one exception here and I'll get your thoughts on this. When Donald Trump came in, there were so many reams of unnecessary executive orders, many of which were not even legal because they only apply to the executive branch, that were stymieing economic growth uh, in this country. And with the stroke of a pen, he eliminated thousands of unnecessary duplicative regulations, which didn't improve the environment, didn't make life safer. It just burdened business. And with that, our economy, because remember, Barack Obama said, the new normal, it's below 2%, will never achieve GDP growth. And suddenly we're at 3.6, 3.8%. I'd say that's the one exception. Right. Well, we can't get out of our own way. So I mirrored what was happening in Washington, uh, in Pennsylvania. So I had a bill, it's the RAINS Act, uh, Regulations in Need of Scrutiny Act. And so it had, it requires that any regulation that has an impact, a fiscal impact on the Commonwealth or the private sector of $1 million or greater would have to go through both the gen the House and the Senate on concurrent resolution before it could be implemented into law. Because you have a lot of unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats that introduce these rules and regs, and they, they have precedents like a statute, and you have to obey them. So we have 153,000 regulations, more than that, on the books in Pennsylvania. So it's trying to rein that back in and get control back into uh, the voters' hands. Well, that's absolutely insane. And I think there's a couple things at work here. Let me get your thoughts on this. I mean, I was astounded when I came back from Tunisia in 2001 after 9-11. I came back to the States and uh, I still listened to all these people whinging about George Bush stole the election. And I'm like, uh, no, he didn't steal the election. Do you not know how our system of politics works, our governance? I mean, of course, I grew up, you probably grew up with, you know, um, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. Remember that? Yeah. So plus, we had, exactly. Scholastic Rock. Plus, we had civics in junior high school and American government high school. But back in 2001, I had a conversation with my sister who was a couple years younger than me. I'm the eldest. And I found out that she wasn't required to take civics in, high, in junior high school in Ohio. It was eliminated after I took it. And then my brother, a year behind her, didn't even have to take American government to graduate from high school. How in the world... Can you have a polity in which people are so politically illiterate? And I think that's part of the problem that takes place here. People don't understand the impact of governance and just how big government is and intrusive it is. They don't. And then you couple that uh, on top of you have this young generation that's very impressionable and hungry for information. And so they get the wrong information, right? They're being indoctrinated with socialism as if it's just this is just a more fair and equitable way for everybody to live. Let's just have a minimum wage of thirty dollars. I mean, an hour, and let's just give everybody education. And why can't everybody just have the same thing? It's not fair that we don't. And it works so well, so well that we have people pouring into our country from every other country that's social, uh, that's that are socialists or communists are fleeing to come here. We don't bother talking to them, but you know they don't know any better because they haven't been educated about what it is. Well, speaking of which, tomorrow on my channel right here, I have Daniel DiMartino. He's a 21-year-old political refugee from Venezuela who came here at the age of 17. Um, he, he was born into a country that was very wealthy, although there was wealth disparity. The country itself was prosperous. And now, of course, under Chavez and his successors, it, it is the embarrassment of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so he'll be on my channel tomorrow talking about he's a member of the Young Americans Against Socialism, trying to educate uh, those who don't seem to care to learn about socialism and all of its ills. You know, for me, it's crazy. I spent uh, 36 and a half years in uniform and fighting communism and socialism all over the world. And and what the heck was I defending? Only to come back here and watch people beat people in the streets? Uh, it's just crazy. 
Right, and every time we turn around, if you look, um, and, and the other side has, you know, there is a strategy in what they're doing. So every time you turn around, they're trying to uh, reform our curriculum, where they're trying to add something into the curriculum. So we've gotten away from core um, education, right, of reading, writing, arithmetic, right, and then uh, teaching them how to be critical thinkers in general. But now it's, oh, we have to teach them about social justice. And do you have this curriculum in there? And we're so busy with all these nonsensical uh, issues around the spectrum that we are missing out, like you said, on civics, on uh, a deeper math, a fundamental understanding of, you know, some of the basics that you need to build on your knowledge. And you talked about those regulations a moment ago. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite scary when you hear about it. I mean, organizations like the Environmental Protection Agency, of course, that was created by Richard Nixon, a Republican of all presidents. But the Environmental Protection Agency, he created that. The, the regulations that are written by bureaucrats in there have been used to imprison American citizens for violating regulations that aren't even law. It's insane. You become a felon for violating a regulation. I can't understand that. Not only a felon, but then they have confiscated our property, right? It's a taking. When you say that I can't do something with my property, it's a taking. Um, so when coupled with the felonies, you also have a taking. That's over and over again, which I always take great issue with. Um, the difference in Pennsylvania, you know, we do a lot of um, ordinances and we do zoning where uh, states like Texas, it's all on deed restrictions, right? So you control it at the personal level there. And, and then you as a consumer know, but oh, these are the are the deed restrictions that come with this property. And then that's how you can proceed forward. And I can decide if I want to buy that property or not. In Pennsylvania, you have your property and then all of a sudden they're, you're zoned commercial or you're zoned agricultural or whatever it may be. And now you're locked into there and they try to say, that's not a taking. It absolutely is a taking. So oh, I, yeah, you uh, have these agencies that do it or these you know smaller elected officials. And um, next thing you know, you're sitting on a piece of property that's not worth anything. Well, absolutely. They can, you know, it's, it's people lose sight of the fact that uh, they could use capricious governance to put you out of business, to destroy your life. Uh, for instance, in South Africa, just to share with you, uh, they have this expropriation without compensation clause that they want to amend the Constitution with. Right now, uh, they, they can do expropriation, essentially manifest destiny. Uh, they can take property, but they have to compensate you fairly. So if they take your cash out of your retirement account, they have to give you the same. So it doesn't really work. Now, they can take your land if they need it for a highway or to redistribute land and pay you a fair market. And then maybe the land does something else. But, but with expropriation without compensation, they can raid your retirement accounts, your bank accounts, take your, your personal own vehicle, your jewelry, and they have to have no justification for it. And it's the mere threat of that that will silence political opponents whatever the government of the day is. And so that's very disturbing when, when governments have the ability to take away from you, either by directly taking or by limiting your abilities to do things. So Chris, that's kind of happening in Pennsylvania, quite frankly, right now. So um, with the governor, okay, that we have, uh, he is ruling through this uh, executive orders, essentially. So we have the Emergency Preparedness Act and he's levied that and, and every day there's a new rule. And then there's an understanding of the rule and an interpretation of the rule, but it's like shifting sands. You don't know what it is. And when you start talking to some of these trade associations, like why aren't you out fighting for your members or why aren't you working on this? Well, they're afraid of further penalizations of the governor. They're afraid, oh, wait, he might take this grant program away or he might take this loan program away. And so they kind of become beasts of the system and they're pandering to it and they don't want to say anything bad and they don't want to get hammered more. So, I mean, I don't know that's a huge difference difference, quite frankly, where we're at. I mean, I had some uh, restaurateurs saying to me, uh, listen, we're following the rules. It's just some bad actors that aren't. So, you know, can you just, as long as we follow all your rules, like you should let us do X, Y, Z. You understand the rules change every stinking minute. Like, it's not just, hey, here's what they are today. That'll change tomorrow. Are you going to keep jumping through those hoops like a monkey? Like it's time everybody has to lock together, go concertedly together, open up and, you know, set your own Set your own guidelines, follow CDC, that you're being safe and move forward. And then, you know, there's risk in business all the time. And I think these are one, this is one of the risks you, you're going to have to assume. Well, you've, you've opened the door. That's a strange sound there. You've opened the door there on uh, the big bad wolf. Uh, that's a topic I was going to talk about here. I did a video. I just came back from Wyoming and I was greeted with the fact that the federal judge Stickman out in the Western District of Pennsylvania declared the uh, lockdown measures unconstitutional by uh, Governor Wolf, which is what I said when he declared that a few months back. I said, this is not within Pennsylvania's constitution. It's certainly not within the federal constitution. So this is not allowable, yet he's getting away with it. But uh, so I titled my video, Tom, the boy who fraudulently cried wolf. 
Uh, and so I talked about that. <laughs> but, oh, great, great. But, and uh, I think, you know, that ruling was great. I was so mad yesterday, and I have a video that'll be coming out because I was just so enraged by how he came out and spoke about it uh, and, and claiming that uh, his, so his statement, it was all political, but his statement was that Republican legislators need to stop celebrating this court ruling and need to stop uh, working, only working for themselves. Uh, and I was so enraged by that because my staff has been working I feel like 24 seven, but by the end of the day, it feels like they're putting into at least 10, 12 hour days because it's nonstop on the phone. It's such desperation of people trying to, you know, get services or trying to get their unemployment comp or trying to get back to work. And nobody at the governor's level is answering the phone. So it's us that are taking it on a daily basis and trying to help them out. And he's nowhere to be found. And he's going to ask us to stop thinking about ourselves. It's outrageous. And he doesn't even talk to us or have any kind of dialogue with us when he's making any of these decisions. Well, he, like many politicians around the world, is working extra, extra legislatively, extra judicially. I mean, uh, in South Africa, this thing called the National Coronavirus Command Council, which consists of the ministers from the cabinet, and they've circumvented the legislature, and they're, they're declaring law by fiat. They've criminalized 250,000 South Africans for sitting in their yard, for walking on a sidewalk, and they, these, these are felonies that they've been charged with. It's insane. And so the same thing is happening here. Wolf is, is circumventing the state legislature and yourself and other, other members members of the legislature, uh, to make dictates that have no basis in reality. And I saw that you, uh, you, were, you stood up for this declaration of a suspension of the Emergency Powers Act just recently. Uh, this is absolutely insane with, with this power grab by politicians, particularly those on the left, around the world. And, and I keep saying that you might you might think, you know, you have those that are scared. And so they might think a mask mandate is reasonable. They might think requiring healthy people to be quarantined in their homes is reasonable. And that's not the point here. What I keep trying to express is that you might think it's reasonable now, but what about the next time whenever, when the governor says this is an economic crisis? How about like we, we declare an economic crisis and therefore everybody has to pay X, Y, Z, help the state out, right? Or whatever the order may be. Are you going to be okay with it then? Is it because it's an emergency and we could collapse, you know? So it, it sounds good now, but what about when you don't like the terms? What about when it's something, oh, I'm not afraid of this? So, I mean, you've got to, freedom is fragile. You know that, right? You served your country. You, you've seen it firsthand in other countries of just how, you know, how the inequities are just enormous. Uh, and freedom is very fragile. And I don't think we should let go of an inch without a fight. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly on this. I, I don't think people truly appreciate. I mean, I get that some people are afraid, especially those with comorbidity, underlying uh, immune uh, health issues that make them more susceptible. But, but listen, I, I'm not an epidemiologist. Of course, you don't need a massive degree to become one. But I have studied epidemiology for the, over 30 years as an intelligence analyst. This is part of what I dealt with when I deal with the topic of threat. The threat can be the weather. It can be an enemy. It can be a terrorist. It can also be the environment. It can also be uh, a disease. And I've, I've been a huge, uh, it's a big, big interest area of mine. This is how, not how we've ever responded to any pandemic or epidemic in the history of Homo sapiens. It's absolutely insane. We've done absolutely everything 180 degrees from the way we normally do it. When you normally have an epidemic or pandemic, you isolate the vulnerable, you protect the vulnerable, and you allow those who don't have underlying conditions who can survive this thing to build up herd immunity so that you reduce the incidence of it in the future. And we've done completely the opposite of that. We've shut the whole world down. And as you've just said, Representative Kiefer, what happens when December comes and the Shanghai virus comes upon us or Ebola mutates and it's here as well. Do we just destroy into perpetuity the social bonds, the links of society, the economic ties, trade? This is utter insanity. Right. And we haven't even quantified the true impacts of what has been done, the action that's been taken right now to counter this. The suicides, our overdose uh, doses that we have, the economic challenges. And then how about just access to care? I mean, I have a volunteer that works in my office who could not get in to get treatment and she had this cancerous patch on her head uh, and they kept putting her off and putting her off and she finally had gotten to the doctor. Uh, the cancer has eaten through her bone is in, in, into her brain now. Because she right? couldn't So how many care. cases of those do you have? Well, that's, you know, actually, uh, Representative Kiefer, the, the reason I started doing live streams uh, wasn't because I was bored. <laughs> was because, uh, I actually had a lot of gigs lined up for consulting uh, after retirement, and then they all kind of fall by the, fell by the wayside with COVID-19 because it's in-person sort of thing. But um, I started doing the live stream on my channel because uh, I realized that the lockdown in South Africa, which was very draconian, you couldn't leave your home. 
no tobacco sales, no alcohol sales, all these, uh, no, no e-commerce. They banned e-commerce. If you want to keep people from getting affected, what's the best way to do it? Let them go in the malls or ban e-commerce? Come on. So they banned e-commerce. But I started doing the live streams because I was concerned about some of the things you talked about. I was worried about, about isolation, about suicides. Also worried about the fact that um, you have entire families together in many informal structures where they're not together all the time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Incest, gender-based violence, abuse. It's just going to be all kinds of problems. And so I started doing the stream so that people had an alternative thing to watch and listen to and discuss. And that's kind of why I did it. But all these things are just ignored. Uh, you know, people banning alcohol and not thinking about those who are actually addicted to alcohol and what they'll do to resort to getting their fix. And in South Africa, they've even banned cigarettes on, on the basis of no scientific data whatsoever. Yeah. And so I had one of my first calls I had in my office uh, within, like, say, what was in April that this happened. So he shut everything down. I think it was on March 19th. But uh, this, her son, this actually it was the father first that had contacted me, but the son had been sober. And I, it was, I think it was over 100 days at least. Um, he was in a halfway house with uh, some other people, and he, but he lost his job. He wasn't able to pay. Um, so he went with some old friends and used one time, overdosed, and he, he has died. And so how many of those cases do you have? You know, that's such a highly addictive, and we know that, you know, there's a re recidivism rate with, with people that are addicted. Um, there's just no forethought, no, like, and even, listen, even if the, initially you take some knee-jerk reactions, because we don't know what this is or how it really is going to impact you. So I don't think anybody's judging you to change course as you go to say, okay, now we know this. Oh, oh this was a bad move. And say, hey, it was a bad move, and so we're going to change course in this direct directions. But there's never any of that. There isn't any of that. So we're not looking back. We're just saying, hey, hey, all of you out there that are really struggling with depression, make sure you call out and try to get help. Well, guess what? There's not resources yeah. for this. And and if you're already isolated, just saying, hey, I can call somebody or put somebody on a on a screen. That is not the same as being physically. No in touch with somebody and, and health professionals know that. So for the governor just to ignore it and just to continue rough shot, calling the shots, not talking to any stakeholders, just in his little bubble, he and Levine is outrageous. <laughs> Don't get me started on Dr. Rachel Levine. We would be here all afternoon uh, yeah. between her and Dr. And, 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 and Governor Wolf. But uh, yeah, so just my question, you know, this telemedicine, how's that pap smear and uh, mammogram working out for you there distance? Good Lord. Right. Yep. Same way as virtual education. How are you doing your uh, labs if you are a dental hygienist? How's that working out, hack? <laughs> Who is not going to come back live until May of 2021? Yeah. Well, listen, um, I'm just, uh, you don't mind me. I'm trying on some of my recent hats here as we discuss here very quickly. I hope you don't mind this. Just got a few here. But uh, listen, um, something that uh, Governor Wolf said uh, back in, uh, I think it was April, I took great offense to it. And ever since then, I've become an outspoken. Um, I've become outspoken against his uh, tyrannical reign here in Pennsylvania under this virus. Uh, he accused small business owners and local mayors and uh, county administrators of being cowards in the face of an unseen enemy. As a combat veteran, uh, and I'm sure first responders and law enforcement officials who put their lives in the line every single day, uh, I know I took great umbrage with that, and I thought that was ridiculous. I went back and double-checked his CV, and I don't recall him ever doing anything beyond the Peace Corps, putting himself at any risk anywhere around the world. So I took great exception to that. I found that deeply offensive. I don't know if, uh, if many of your constituents felt the same way, but I suspect they did. They did. And in Pennsylvania in general, such great offense was taken. And, you know, we have more veterans in Pennsylvania than anyone, any other state. So people took great offense to it. But I think, again, it just demonstrated once again how disconnected and disengaged he is from the average citizen, for sure. And he has surrounded himself with a bunch of 20, 30 something year olds that are writing everything up for him and these little bit of sound bites, right? And this is their reality. And so he's just regurgitating this because he's surely not out and about with people. Because I assure you, I just tweeted out this morning, I said, you know, at Governor Wolf, I, I invite you to spend just one day in my district office answering the phones and meeting with the constituents and see if you would still levy all the orders that you're levying. No, it's absolutely crazy. Like I said, I've got more, more hats here to try on. So, uh, yeah, but it's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. I remember seeing, I'm not a big fan of Facebook. I think it's the domain of 12 year old girls, but, uh, anyway, uh, so I don't go on there much, but, uh, I did uh, see a thing on Facebook a few months back from Rob Ruth, from Bob Ruth Ford here in Dillsburg. 
And um, I saw that um, he did a video, and he did several apparently, and they're very impassioned. He was he wasn't he wasn't impassioned, but the video itself was impassioned. From a standpoint, he said, "Listen, now we have the capital. We'll survive this. My business. It's we've been here for three generations. It's going to be okay." But I had to lay off 95% of my employees and send them home. And a lot of these people live from paycheck to paycheck. And this capricious lockdown of small and medium-sized enterprises is killing us. And I remember very poignantly him saying that he had like 130 cars that people, and trucks that people had already purchased before the lockdown went into effect. And the government would not allow the customers to come pick up the cars. And I'm thinking, okay, all you do is sanitize, you clean off the windshield, you park the car in a lot, you put the key on the front seat, you leave it unlocked with the registration, you go stand behind the glass window at the dealership, and then the customer comes, they come up, they show their ID, okay, it is you, Don, you can get your truck now, and you drive away in your truck. Why would the state prevent that? I mean, that's um, those people are making car payments on cars they can't even possess because of this lunacy of this government. It actually drove me nuts. It, and that happened with real estate. It was the same thing. It was over and over different. A roofing company, uh, you know, they weren't allowed to unless you redeemed yourself. So you couldn't put on a new roof. You could go out and do repairs. It was just that kind of an asinine, illogical thought that was not in, in the process anywhere. But, you know, at one point, uh, Rob Roof uh, had somebody from the governor's administration on heckling him on Facebook. Now, can you imagine Imagine that some a staffer is coming on harassing taxpayers who are so desperate, they're just trying to go to work. I mean, I was so infuriated by that, but the person took it down right away. But we were we were we were connecting the dots on that. I mean, just that's just how arrogant and pompous they are about it. Like, I'll tell you what you need. Like, I'm gonna determine what your needs are. Your needs are being met, you know, because I said they are. And that's essentially where this governor is at. Yeah, no, it's it's really just, I don't know why I keep speaking that sound, but it's really disturbing. Um, it, 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 it bothers me a great deal. But uh, in the comments here, Emery Forster, who's in South Africa, says, Chris Wyatt, we don't want the USA to open up too much. Why? You will get so busy with consulting jobs that you won't have time to stream. <laughs> Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's true since my consulting is focused mostly in Africa. But sorry, I'm, I just got a few more hats here. I just thought I'd put this one on now. <laughs> so this is my Duck Dynasty one, I guess. You got the uh, 45 on one side and uh, the American flag on the other. But anyway, but uh, seriously, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I saw what frustrates me is now. While I was in Wyoming, I found out that Smash Burger, the national hamburger chain, has gone bust. That Gold's Gym, the iconic Gold's Gym, the the. The, the signature mark of uh, fitness centers has gone bankrupt because of this nonsense around the country. It's insane how many brands, how many. Uh, I, I, I interviewed um, uh, the candidate for Pennsylvania's 5th District, which is south of Philadelphia, for Congress. That's um, Dasha Pruitt. Uh, she's a Russian immigrant to the United States. Her parents were political refugees. Her father painted Lenin in a dress back under the Soviet regime. They put him in the gulag. I guess they didn't like that. So they finally got out. She came here at the age of 10. She's fed up with this. Um, so she's running for Congress uh, in the 5th District. And we talked about that. Her husband, uh, they have a family photography business. It's three generations. It started during the Depression, 1932. Survived the Depression, survived the Second World War, survived everything, recessions, everything since then. And normally they do about 500 weddings per year. They've done five this year. This is insane. Well, we had a hearing, um, not last week. Um, or was it, I think, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before. Um, but uh, one of the we wedding venue people was... Uh, had come to testify and was in tears crying because um, they were being sued by three different, I guess, brides and uh, families about, you know, their down payment and cancellations of weddings. And so that's a whole industry that's gone bust and understand, uh, again, which Governor Wolf doesn't sit back and think because I mean, I don't think he gets what, how these businesses operate. You can't make that up. It's like a haircut. You can't make up a haircut. They're not coming in and getting two haircuts the next time, right? They're just going to get one haircut and they'll get a little more cut off. So you can't recapture that revenue. And I don't think that's, they, they don't get that. And so my friends on the other side of the aisle continuously say, well, let's do this grant program. Let's do this to help mom and pop businesses. Listen, I had a lady call last week in tears and it was a third generation retail business and they supplied restaurants. And she was calling to scream at me because we had just sent out information about a grant program that was out there. And I think it's a $35,000 grant. Mm -hmm. She said, that's a joke for me right now. I don't need, I, that's not, I need to work. 
If I don't have a stream of revenue that I know is coming in, 35,000 isn't going to help me. Not to mention, I just took a loan out last year and I can't cover the nut on that. She said, I need to be able to work. I need predictability. That's all I need you to do. I don't want one of your handouts, but that's all that, that seems to be their solution. And understand that's still even picking winners or losers. Not every business gets it. So if you're lucky to get it, you know, that might help you, but there's many that don't qualify or many that aren't chosen to get these grants. No, that's absolutely correct. You know, what's, gosh, bless it. I don't know what that is. That's strange, but it sounds like I'm talking through a pipe when it starts. But what's really strange about this is that, and you've touched on it, is, is that um, the economic opportunity loss, you don't recoup that. People don't realize that uh, if, if you don't have economic activity, you just don't get it back in the future. You never get it back. It is gone forever. It is wealth and accumulation of wealth possible accumulation wealth that will never be recovered. It's gone for all perpetuity. Now, you might in the future somehow come up with something that gives you 10, 20% gangbuster growth in your business, but you're not going to recoup where you were before. And when you multiply that across the, the York County, across the state, across the country, it's absolutely insane. Right. We're looking at 60% of business losses. I mean, that's Phenomenal. That is a, a phenomenal number that you're looking at. And how are you going to recover from that? The impacts of jobs. And then let's talk about the impact of the revenues. So, I mean, there's going to be a come to Jesus moment in November when we have to sit down and do that budget. It's going to be even worse than next year. If people aren't working, they're not paying income tax and they're not paying, they're not buying more consumables. So they're not paying um, sales tax. So there will be some real rubber that hits the road and everybody's going to take a haircut and it's going to get ugly. Oh, I know where that's going. I can, oh, All right. I, I know where that's going. I can predict Democrats it already. are already saying, and taxes, I, I would like everybody to hear this. Increase yeah, taxes. But here's in Pennsylvania, so ours is 3.67. That's our income tax. Democrats are already saying, just raise it 2%. Just 2%. That is a 65% increase. That's huge. Huge. And they're going to roll over and concede on that. And then on top of it, now, Governor Wolf doesn't think in Pennsylvania that you are um, smart enough or, or informed enough to take care of your own health, right, with the virus. But he wants you to be able to smoke pot anytime you want. So he can bankroll that on our vulnerabilities as well. Um, whether it's good or not, listen, government never does anything effectively or efficiently. So giving them one more pot of money so that they can prey on the most vulnerable at this time uh, is a really, really um, ignorant and foolish move to make. Well, I agree. Folks, you're listening. Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adaba Africa channel here on YouTube. I'm Chris in Central Pennsylvania, and my special feature guest today is State Representative Don Kiefer from Pennsylvania's 92nd Congressional District. Uh, we're talking about <laughs> all the lunacy and chaos taking place around us here. I haven't even got to some of the, the signature things that she's been working on. We're going to do that in just a moment, but uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. So, Representative Kiefer, uh, you, you, you just talked about taxes, and that's what I was predicting. This is going to happen across the board. Well, we had a shortfall on the budget. No, 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 no. You destroyed our economy, which meant you got no revenue. And now you want to raise our rates and make our lives even more miserable. But that's where we're headed. And nobody wants to take any cuts. So even schools are saying we need more money. We need more money. While our schools got CARES funding, right? And they're not in-person training, but they're saying, oh, well, we need to adapt with everything we need, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi or computers or whatever it may be. Um, and then on the other side, we have do have one group of teachers, not all of them. They're saying, don't make us go in and and teach, it's too dangerous uh, to do that. Uh, so if people can't, families can't get their kids back in school, right? They can't go back to work or they've got another. Whoops, what happened there? We got a little break. People are going to, again, there'll be a come to Jesus moment when you see, we just this year, we have a $5 billion shortfall, 5 billion. Wow, that's um, that's just here in Pennsylvania. That's it's crazy stuff. So uh, Topsy Kretz uh, sent a message a bit ago and said that uh, I love the state rep's recent op-ed on the taxpayers' return on investment in public education. Uh, can you tell us about that? Because I think other than Topsy Kretz, probably none of the rest of us had a chance to read that. <laughs> right. So I'm just I was going through and talking about you know uh, accountability. Uh, if if we are going to make these concessions uh, as far as how our academic community did relook at how we're doing academics and how what we're getting on the money that we are putting into education. So are our kids able to compete? Um, are our kids prepared? Um, are we, you know, is there one track for all? I don't think so. 
So it, it's talking about all those and it's talking about how we're going to adapt because everybody seems to dig in their heels and say, no, 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 this is how it has to be done, how it's always been done. And it hasn't been working, right? Uh, take just standards-based education. We've been doing that for at least 35, probably close to 40 years and haven't made any measurable gains. And those, and listen, this is not a, this isn't a partisan issue because it's gone over through various administrations, but the same educrats remain in place and they double down on standards-based education, uh, that that's how we're going to do it. So we got to rethink this. What education is not one size fits all. Um, it's not sustainable at the amount of money that we're putting into it. And then we're not getting our returns out of the volume of money that we're putting into it. So you know what, let's start maybe, maybe the dollars follow the children um, and, and let them pursue these different paths. Uh, I think you have to start looking at things like that. Well, I'd agree. Uh, let me get your thoughts on this. I um, I started a hashtag, and not not your thoughts on the hashtag, but 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 what I'm going to get to the substance of it. A few weeks ago, I was very angry when I just thought, sat back and realized that kids haven't been in school for over six months now, and um, that means the schools haven't been paying for buses, which is a big part of the expense in a place like this with rural schools and peri-urban. So all the money saved, not paying for fuel and maintenance on buses, no school trips going anywhere. No utilities except for the occasional flush of a toilet and a light or two on in a school. Yet my property taxes have not gone down one cent. Now, I'm not begrudging, even though they take a big chunk of my income in property taxes for a school district, uh, which I have no kids in. But, um, you know, we have to pay it forward so the generations are educated. So I get that concept. I'm not opposed to paying taxes. But my point is, if they're not going to let kids go back to school... I did hashtag no school, no taxes. Um, you would think that local school districts might be flush with cash now if you're not involved in public education. So what exactly is going on there? They've been accumulating property taxes every quarter. So two two tax payments have come out of my escrow account now to pay for local school. And there have been no kids in school. And uh, I don't know where we're at. Are we going to school? Are we in this zone? Are we in that zone? Are we forcing kids to be online? Where are we at with this? So, Chris, there's a couple things. First of all, some kids are, some schools are in. Um, uh, my son uh, goes to, my one son goes, to, he's in high school, so he goes to Northern. They're in these cohorts in high school two days a week. Uh, they go Monday, Tuesday, second cohort goes uh, Tuesday, Thursday. Nobody goes Friday. I think elementary is five days, but I'm not positive. And again, they're jumping through all these Pennsylvania Department of Education guidelines that are as clear as mud. And then now my my younger son who goes to Catholic school, they're five days a week. Now, if you don't feel safe doing that, you can do virtually, you can do two days a week, but, and they're still trying to navigate all that, but they're able to figure it out and get, get there in person, uh, in person, face-to-face, -face, five days a week. Here's the big thing though. 70% uh, of school district's budget at minimum is pensions, is, is salary and pensions. So they're not saving that money. There's a, not even quite 30%, you know, that they have that they could be saving. Now, a lot of school districts paid all those bus contracts anyway. Mm. Um, so, and I'm not sure how those negotiations work because surely they uh, didn't have the fuel charges or the, um, you know, wages. If they, a lot of them don't have full-time wages. Now, some of them do, bus drivers. They sub that out to different uh, bus companies. So, you know, these were all some of the different things. A lot of Schools paid their coaches, despite the fact that they did not have uh, spring sports. So they were still paying a lot of these things. And here's the big kicker, which, which we just tried to work on this week. Uh, Pennsylvania Pension Fund is very poorly uh, managed. We have a lot of issues in there and we can't get basic reforms because every time we get a package together, one of the bills was mine uh, that we just passed uh, this week. Uh, PSEA, which is our teachers union in Pennsylvania, throws a wrench into it and they get just enough members that, you know, it goes down every time. And if we don't get some kind of rain in on our pension system, it doesn't really matter. It's all going bankrupt. And, and people don't think that the state can go bankrupt. It absolutely can. And our pension system is on the verge. Uh, we're looking at like a 40% increase if we don't get some of these things in place. Well, I, See, that's uh, where your, your property taxes, you're, they're probably going to go up again because of the, the pension costs. Well, that explains it. Uh, as you said, 70% uh, goes to salaries and pensions, which doesn't shock me. I didn't know the figure, but you know, I used to cover the South African military and people ask about the state of their readiness. And I said, well, it's kind of hard to be ready when 82% of your budget goes to pay salaries. And that's what it was. 
And here we have in the U.S. the military whining about one third of the budget going to salaries because they can't buy big weapon systems. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> so the school districts really, really handcuffed if, if they're putting that much money out on salaries. Yet we constantly hear the teachers are underpaid. Uh, now, they may be, uh, but my experience has been mostly that's with entry-level teachers. Once they get established, they, they tend to have a decent living in most places, uh, generally speaking. Yeah, and I think in Pennsylvania, they're starting the average salary starting is like 40, uh, is in the uh, low to mid-40s and benefits. And then, you know, again, you're working, you have that timeline, right, too, that you're working. So you have, you, you're doing nine, ten months out of the year. There's a couple of really nice comments that came in here. One from Sloth Puppy said, this lady is not only great, but she has a lovely personality. I wish she was living and serving our country, enjoying the interview. So he's from South Africa. Thank you. <laughs> and then Stronger Together just said, interesting discussion, lovely guest. Okay. Um, now the next one here is from Andre Jacobs. He's a South African who is living in China, of all places. And he says, seriously, people, the lockdown in China ended in March, April, and everything is back to normal here. What's going on in the West? Well, I'll tell you, Andre, this is all a big plot to get orange man bad. Don't you realize that? That's what it's all about. Right. And, and you know, fear, let's not underestimate uh, the, the fear factor, right? Fear can, can control a lot of people with fear, and, and that's they're succeeding quite well at this. I mean, I, you got, I think you'd be shocked with how many calls I would get from people asking, are they allowed to like deliver a meal to a friend? Are they allowed to go to their house for just a regular grocery store? Do they have to wear a mask? Can somebody make them wear a mask? I mean, over and over again, people are asking these questions. I just find it outrageous because I'm always, uh, my philosophy in life always has been, I, you know, I will beg for forgiveness, not ask for permission. Uh, so I, I usually take that approach uh, with something, but you know, basic freedoms. I, I'm not sorry. You're not. You're not masking me up. I'm. I'm not afraid of it. You know, I will respect your space, but you're not. You know, putting a mask on my face. You know, you're talking about these alternate. Uh, I I respect that. By the way, that's a great <laughs> statement. But uh, you, you're talking about alternate days, cohorts, and stuff like that. I mean, wait a second. If I'm a high school junior and I go to school Monday and Tuesday, and my girlfriend goes Thursday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That don't seem fair. I'm just saying. Anyway. <laughs> well, it doesn't. And listen, let me tell you on top of it. So even my son, who's in Catholic school that goes five days a week, uh, they're keeping the classes all in their own bubbles, right? They have all these different measures in place. And I get the constraints that they're under. But he's not with any of his friends. He comes home every day. I have to stop him. I'm like, okay, I can't listen to any more of this complaining nonstop. I get it. If you want to go virtual, you can do that. He does it. He wants the socialization. But at recess, he can't play with any of his friends. The teacher has a two yardsticks taped together that she walks around and makes sure everyone's keeping six feet apart. It's just so crazy. Like, I feel like we've all just lost our minds. I was going to get into some of the topics that are related to your constituents in our district here, but I'll get those in a moment. But, but, but what you said just brings something up to me, you know, and, and this goes back to the beginning when we first started talking. What disturbs me about all of this is that government officials at every level all around the world, including our federal level, simply don't have the humility and honesty to be honest with us. And they tell us and dictate to us how things are. And then they're constantly wrong. Let's just run through a short list of how they've been wrong. Uh, let's see. Dr. Tedros in mid-January said that the Chinese have set the gold standard for how to deal with the pandemic. Yet he failed to point out that three to five million people from Wuhan escaped Wuhan before the lockdown took place, got to Shanghai and to the coast, spread it into coastal cities on the cruise ships that were headed to Japan. And then Chinese, Europeans and Americans and Africans all got on planes and flew back around the world carrying the virus with them. So that's not a gold standard. Then also he said that, uh, and the Chinese echoed that this virus is not transmittable human to human. Uh, uh, how do you think we get it? That's there. Then they also told us, uh, don't wear masks. Uh, they're ineffective, which I agree with. Uh, but, but don't wear masks are ineffective while we shipped all of our existing personal protective equipment to China from all over the world. So they sucked up all our PPE and we had none left. They also told us that the fatality rate was 3.25 to 3.45, which is astronomically high for a disease, when it's actually 0.15 to 0.25, only slightly higher than influenza. They also told us you can't give it to your pets. Then they said, no, keep your pets safe because you can give it to your pets. Uh, my point is that they have no humility whatsoever. They constantly dictate to people and they wonder why people are upset with them. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And they wonder why everybody's questioning and not trusting what they say. Exactly. And then let's not get, even get into the hydrochloroquine, right? That's the uh, other. No, no, let's, let's, just, 
Let's get into uh, it so that my video gets banned. Let's okay. get deplatformed. No, but so, no, what, what, I, what I find disturbing about that is that, listen, I, I, as I mentioned, I follow epidemiology. So I kept up with a French study that was done early in February that indicated that zinc and, and, and um, azithromycin, I think the combination of those had, yeah. had a, a, a beneficial palliative effect for those who were infected at the early stages of it. And so it was a French study. The French released it pretty quickly. So someone at Trump staff or, or, or on the coronavirus camp, command, whatever, they, 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 they pushed it to Trump. Trump did mention it was a French study and he comes out and says hydrochloroquine. So, oh my gosh, it's witch doctor. It's, it's you know, it's witchcraft. Um, and then, then they go to these great lengths to pretend that this is a dangerous drug, which has been approved for use for over five decades. I have taken that drug to fight malaria over the past three decades with no ill effects. And then they just lie about it. Oh, if you have this disease. Well, yeah, that's why it's a prescription drug in America. You can't just give it to somebody over the counter. You have to see a physician who knows your condition. And 99 out of 100 people can take the drug safely. And they just twist it all around. And how many people have suffered or died because they didn't get access to this drug potentially now? Crazy. Well, not only that, why are we not just giving it to all of our patients in our nursing homes, right? Because this is what you do in Africa, right? I mean, it's for malaria. And so there's a lot of these third world countries where they, you know, come in and they'll, this will just be a standard drug. So they're not getting it. Why are we, I mean, this is so foolish. And then that one study that by the two guys that were paid by the company, uh, that's, uh, by uh, the company that manufactures remdesivir, right? Yes. Um, it was so outrageous. And they were, they did their study. Well, oh, it was three times the recommended dose. Well, three times the recommended dose of anything is going to give you heart palpitations and could could send you into cardiac arrest. So, I mean, it was so ridiculous. We were going over the top with that. If anybody just did a monochrome, a research, you could see everything was debunked on that. And I think that it's, it's just so egregious that's out there. And it, it, quite frankly, I think it borders on criminality because we could have saved a lot more people early on with this. No, I agree. And it's just, it's, we're st still debating this and we're still seeing tech titans, deplatform right. people, Twitter, um, YouTube. Never under underestimate the power of money. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you right. on that one. So there, there's a, a comment here, and I don't know if this might be my fault or, or maybe your sites don't know, but someone said they tried to go to your official site and it doesn't work. I don't know if they took the link from the video. If it's wrong, it's my apologies. But what I'll do is after I get off, I'll, I'll speak to Representative Kiefer and make sure I've got the correct link for her official okay. website because um, you, have, you have a campaign website, then you have a state website, correct? I just have a state website. Oh, you just have a state website. Okay, well, that, mm -hmm. then maybe the state's down. <laughs> or, or or I pasted it incorrectly. But yeah, I'll... I was going to say, the campaign website, there isn't one. I have a Facebook page and a Twitter page and I think a Instagram page. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're talking. I can give all that to you later. Okay. We'll get. We'll make sure we have that correct. But we're talking politics more on a local level here. This isn't like a Nancy Pelosi campaign for San Francisco. Right. So, yeah. Whether she spends a million dollars on her campaign at least. But, yeah. No. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 absolutely. I mean, this this whole thing is deeply disturbing on so many levels. And you you touched on it, Representative Kiefer, when you said that what happens when the next thing happens. You know, it's like they they, they told us this was a seasonal virus. Well, that wasn't the case because I watched it spread all over the southern hemisphere while they were in winter and we were in summer. And now we're going back to fall and they're going back to spring and it hasn't changed uh it's really it's 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 i don't know it's what when does how it, many what, times is it mutated because that's what oh, i've heard as well yeah, so it's yeah. mutated how many times right of course and it was never like everybody kind of conceded in the beginning and it was never about like eradicating the virus it was about making sure we flatten the curve right that's how they pitched all this we're gonna flatten the curve and make sure that our health systems don't get overwhelmed well we have decimated the curve right it's almost a b at this point yep. and our health systems are underwhelmed. In fact, in Pennsylvania, uh, we were losing uh, collectively with our health. Okay. Our healthcare facilities got together and said, hey, Governor Wolf, uh, we're opening up and we will start to be doing um, all of these elected pr procedures and we're gonna move forward with it. So um, he didn't tell them, they told him, hey, this is how we're gonna operate. Some of my hospitals around me were furloughing Healthcare workers, nurses were getting furloughed um, and then people weren't getting different procedures. So um, we we met all that criteria. We did it. It was never about, you know, eradicating the virus. Uh, we live with the flu all the time. We don't lock down healthy people. No, it's exactly right. This, is, whoa, this microphone, what's going on? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're exactly correct. It's 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 an upside down response to this thing. And what we've done is we've prolonged it. Uh, in my video against uh, against the position, the unconstitutionality of Governor Wolf. I, by the way, I did call for his resignation. I don't know if that's radical or not. He's violated the U.S. Constitution, so I think he should do the honorable thing and resign. 
<laughs> and I, I, listen, and I didn't sign on to impeachment right away, but I believe we've made the case for impeachment. I, I'm not doing this as some kind of, you know, political move. I mean, the, between 70 percent of Pennsylvania's deaths are from nursing homes. Right. Yep. And it was his policy that required them to accept positive patients and then allowed for the cohabitation of infected and non-infected patients. Right. Yep. And how about what he did to Lebanon County withholding the money that he was statutorily required to release Violating, so violating the law. So, I mean, over and over again, and then your constitutional rights. And, and so I think that we have more than made the case uh, for that uh, uh, as far as, I, as impeachment goes for me. So is there is there an impeachment movement in the state legislature against the governor? I wasn't aware of that. We have a bill in the House, um, and I believe there is one in the Senate, but it's not moving anywhere. I mean, it would take our, you know, Pennsylvanians really pushing and putting a lot of pressure on their legislators. Don't contact central Pennsylvania legislators. We support it. I mean, but you got to get your, uh, you know, go outside of the state and get people to sign on to it and, and then get that, get the leaders to put it on the calendar. Well, my approach is a much more uh, a faster one, and that's I think should just do the honorable thing and resign because he's violated the Constitution. That's the basic law. That's the ultimate responsibility he has as governor is to uphold our Constitution at the, at the national and the state level. So I think he should just resign. I actually call for him to yeah, resign. Yeah, he's so arrogant. He would never do that. I mean, the oh. arrogance, like his statement coming out after the judge made his ruling, which was just so telling, um, is you see what he's going to do. He's, yeah. he's never going to relinquish this power. Now, now, they, of course, around the country, uh, there, there's this big thing where we're, we're banning lawful assembly, you know, our amendment to, to seek redress of grievances from our government. And we see people go to Harrisburg. Uh, some were wearing masks because it wasn't recommended at the time. Some were wearing masks. Some weren't. They were carrying signs. They were well behaved. Most of them kept a safe distance apart. And mm -hmm. they were driving past State House, and they were characterized as right wing racist nut jobs. When I saw blacks, Hispanics, even some Asians, and white uh, Pennsylvanians who were there protesting this. But then people go and loot and burn and cause mayhem and create self declared autonomous zones in cities, and they get a free pass from the press. And then they even go so far as to include racial segregation in their self declared autonomous zone, saying that only black people can come here. And we spent six decades stopping this nonsense, and we see all this lunacy going on. Uh, it's it's a legislator. I imagine it's got to be something that's it's kind of like, you know, boggling your mind. I know I'm confused. No, and it's infuriating to me. I mean, I, I just think that media is as responsible for all this as anybody. They have perpetuated the fear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't report all of the facts and the gaslighting is outrageous, right? I mean, this nonstop gaslighting that they have, uh, you know, like you said, mostly peaceful protests. Um, I'm watching you set dumpsters on fire. I'm watching you spray paint state police officers and destroy their cars um, and, and destroy businesses and just complete mayhem, mostly peaceful protests, mostly peaceful protests. And that's why I think that they have, you know, they're coming out with the name calling and you're racist. That's the easiest thing, right? Yeah. You're all racist. Um, the gaslighting of the systemic racism, right? Systemic, let's just say it over and over again, maybe it'll be a reality. When the reality is your data does not support that notion. There are acts of racism that are occurring out there, but systemic racism, you don't have, the, the numbers do not support that. But that's not what they're gonna keep telling you over and over again, you listen to it. It just should be, I, I don't know how that's not criminal. And I, I can't believe people still watch it, but I know they do and I know they believe it. What's frustrating for me is what, Okay. What's frustrating for me is watching law enforcement be pulled back or sit by like in New York City, Philadelphia and cities and watching people being assaulted in the streets, property being destroyed, uh, unbelievable capital offenses being committed and law enforcement nowhere to be seen. And then after months of this nonsense, when people show up peacefully carrying uh, rifles as a militia in Louisville, not that I'm supporting militias, they behave themselves, they say they're protecting property, they're not causing anything, and then another militia shows up with the intention to confront them, and people from overseas, I saw ITV report from the United Kingdom, in this unprecedented situation of these dangerous right-wing militias, which are out here causing from, I mean, where were you for the last five months, Rocco? I mean, May 1st or whenever it was, May, this nonsense started May 30th, and it's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, but let me get off that for a second because we talked about it for hours. So Croy Thompson, who is uh, one of my uh, viewers from the Caribbean Basin originally, um, he asked a question, which I guess is apropos for somebody from the Caribbean Basin. He says, what measures are there in Pennsylvania for legalizing cannabis? I don't even know the state. Is it legal here for medicinal use? Medicinal use only. Okay. So, um, and that was nose under the tent. I mean, the next step is uh, they're trying to do recreational. And then Tom uh, Wolf, 
just came out and called on the legislature, who he hasn't spoken to in six months, called on us to uh, put a plan forth that includes uh, legalizing recreational marijuana. So our, he just renewed the 10th opioid um, emergency declaration. The 10th, okay, but our opioid numbers in York County, we're like the third in the state as far as opioid uh, overdoses. It's, it, we have a huge epidemic here and we're just getting it under controls and our numbers are going back up to double digits monthly. Okay, and this is happening throughout the state and you wanna add recreational marijuana. We can't find enough workers right now. You know, For a while it was the unemployment comp system was, was compensating you so much people, it didn't pay you to go to work, but we can't find drivers who can show up and pass a drug test, but let's legalize recreational marijuana. And then let's take you as an employer. Imagine working for UPS, some recreational marijuana. How do you even navigate that as a, as a business owner? I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, cause it's not, it's not legal in any others, you know, it's not legal nationally, you can't do it. So, I mean, it is such a, a, a beast that you would even think about this right now. And again, we don't have, he doesn't think that we're smart enough or capable enough to make good health decisions, right? Has us uh, uh, sort of locked down at 25% in our business, but he trusts us all to go out and smoke weed. It makes no sense. It's so ridiculous. No, I, I, gosh, bless. I don't understand what's going on with that microphone, whatever, if it's just the feed, but that's unusual. But uh, no, I agree with you. It's 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 absolutely insane. Uh, my brother was in the Ohio National Guard and they spent their summers um, hunting down weed plantations in Southeastern Ohio. 20, 30 years ago and burning weed uh, all over the place. And now just the permissive attitude towards it. And then uh, not to pick on Croy, but he's responding in here to people asking questions about weed as if there are no negative consequences to weed. In fact, there are. People just want to deny it. I'm not here anti-weed or anti-marijuana, uh, although I don't care for it, but I'm just making the point that, and I think this is where you're going. We already have an opioid crisis in this in this state. Uh, can we focus on that before we legalize other illicit substances? I mean, what, right. what's the rush to legalize? Now, for your, let me ask this question, for your county, is, is there a preponderance of, of these opioid overdoses and usages, in, say, in the, the sole urban center in York City itself, or is it all over the county? It's all over the county. It really is. So it's not, uh, it has no boundaries, uh, you know, socioeconomic. I mean, it's all families, and it is... Uh, it's really, really crazy that uh, the, the problem that we have, it's so, it, it's just the desperation. Uh, I've did a lot of education awareness when I first took office about it, just because of how many parents were just completely oblivious to the fact that their, their child was using it or even was exposed to it. So um, our, um, our corner here and our DA in, in this county, in York County, have done an outstanding awareness job in the county and just bringing light to different policies and, and things that we need to have in place to really tackle this. So uh, we'll, we're continuing to plug away at it. I just feel like all the gains they had just made with it have just been you know pulled out from underneath of them with this whole crisis. Well, there's there's... There's a topic here I'd really like to bring up before before we get to the end of this, and I think this is a really important one. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, now, uh, with the end of the Civil War, we passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which ended slavery, uh, granted citizenship to former slaves, and then guaranteed the right to vote to black men. But people seem to forget when they talk about discrimination in this country or unfairness that when they complain about things, black men got the vote decades before any women in this country. It wasn't until the 19th Amendment, which is just over three weeks ago, we hit the century mark. On the 26th of August, 1920, the 19th Amendment was finally ratified, and we got suffrage for all women in this country. So uh, I was reading through your newsletter, because I didn't have these statistics, so I'm going to reference them real quick, because I think it's actually something for Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania to be a little bit proud about. Over the last 98 years, 185 women have been elected to the Pennsylvania State House, and um, they've represented 48 of 67 counties. So I guess we've got a little, little more way to go there to get all counties represented. And today there are 55 uh, female legislatures who make up one quarter of the chamber's population. Uh, obviously, you're one of those members. Um, what's it like being a woman uh, elected to the legislature here in Pennsylvania? You know, if it's, it's a different type of uh, legislating, I think, you know, just women and men being different. Uh, I feel like we are more uh, practical, like we're not really interested in doing the dog and pony shows and the hearing. We're more of like, hey, we have this much time. Let's just get this done. <laughs> Does everybody have to speak on something? Uh, so it's just a little different approach that way. Um, but I, I just think we just sometimes bring a different perspective, right? It's even with parenting. Uh, my husband's now my house husband. I'll come home and say, did the kids do their homework? And his response is, well, I told him to. And 
you know, where I'm more of a sit down and do it kind of person. So I will say this though, uh, so York County where I live and I have, I have one municipality in Cumberland County I represent, um, but in York County, we're one of the most conservative counties in the Commonwealth. Uh, we won our county by 60,000 votes for Donald Trump, if that gives you any kind of indication. And uh, we have a huge amount of women legislators. So we had more uh, female uh, legislators, uh, representatives, than we had males up until uh, Senator Kristen Phillips Hill just went over to the Senate. So now we have a female Senator over there. In my seat particularly, I'm not the first woman who has served in my seat. So uh, um, Jane, I can't think of her last name right at the moment, but she was a trailblazer and, and she held the seat back in the 70s. So. Um, I think uh, women have been blazing the trail. I think the best thing we can do is not be victims. I am never a supporter of the victim mentality. Hey, did bad things happen or did, were we disadvantaged? Absolutely. But I think the best thing we can do and what I've always done is let's pay it forward. Let's, you know, I reach out to young women and I, I was an advisor uh, for a sorority at Gettysburg College for 17 years and helping with career development and, and how to position yourself and really how to put yourself out there and connect because relationships and connections are as much as anything when you're trying to get a job. Uh, so helping, help giving each other a hand up and, and some advice and just having a mentor, I think is the best thing we can do as women and, um, and not be the victim. No, I think those are... I make sure I got the mic here. I think those are fantastic comments. Uh, I, it's it's interesting to see this century uh, being celebrated now because the left tries to take credit for it. But if you go back to historically the suffragettes, virtually every one of them was a Republican woman without fail uh, on every issue like this, whether it's ending slavery, whether it's uh, equality. It's always been Republicans have been out in front of this. But uh, the, those who write the history books tend to lie about and misrepresent. But uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Susan B. Anthony, I could run through the whole list of suffragettes. Almost every one of them was a conservative Republican woman. Funny how that worked out. Right, it is. I mean, and, and it's kind of, I think that goes along with a lot of, you know, when you're a mom and you're mothering, right, it's uh, it's accountability and it's taking responsibility in, in my house. Like, I don't want to hear your excuses, suck it up, and here's what needs to be done, and you didn't make the benchmark. And so, and my kids know, I'm a, I'm a tough mom, uh, but, you know, they, they know what's expected and they know there's consequences. And I, I think, you know, and I hold them accountable, and you're responsible for your actions. And all of your actions. So don't come to me and say, oh, this person hurt my feelings and they said I'm a loser and, you know, um, they're bad and I want you to go protect me. Well, are you a loser? You control your feelings. Like you can only be that if you allow yourself to be that. You know, you're not, are you dumb or are you, no, you're a smart person. Like, you know, those are words. And so it's instead of always helping our kid be a victim, let's help them, you know, be strong in who they are and, and brush off those and, and make sure that, you know, they're, they're reaching out to people that are supportive and, and you know, helping them move forward. So uh, that's, I think that's the best thing that we can do for all mankind, quite frankly. And like, we're, let's not all be victims. Well, folks, <laughs> folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adobe Africa channel. And my special feature guest today is State Representative Don Kiefer from Pennsylvania's 92nd Congressional District in York County primarily with a little bit of Cumberland County stuck in there for just uh, just to keep people confused. But uh, we've run up on an hour here, and I don't know if Representative Kiefer can stay a little bit longer or not. I don't want to indulge in her time, but there's a couple other things I'd like to ask. If Can you stay a little bit longer or do you have to go? I was going to say, I can entertain one more question, but I do okay. have to get back she's out to, to the discussion. Right. Well, because uh, she's got to get back and repeal uh, legislation, hopefully. So, <laughs> so uh, with the election coming up in November, I'll wrap it up with this one then. So with the election coming up in November, do you have any personal concerns about what direction we're headed? Do you do you think that um, that the national level we can uh, not we but the Republicans can excuse me, <laughs> the Republicans can uh, retain the Senate and perhaps regain the House and that President Trump will get reelected or or do you think that it's going to go a different direction? Uh, you know, so as far as the House and Senate go on a national level, you know, those races uh, it comes down to local, right? Uh, it's not necessarily driven by the presidential election, although sometimes it can be. Um, so I, I, I can't, I couldn't really tell you for sure. I mean, I know we're spending billions of dollars on it. It's really just obscene. Um, but I can tell you there is a silent majority and I'm hearing it more and more. I just said last week, I can't tell you how many emails I got where it says, I've been, you know, a Democrat all my life and I'm done. I'm walking away or I'm, I'm registering, I'm re-registering. So, um, 
I feel that you're, you're going to be surprised. People are turning the channels off. They're turning out the noise and they are just going to go do what they want to do. Uh, and, and they are tuning out to the media because they're done being, you know, shamed and barraged on a daily basis. So I think you have that silent majority factor, which again, I think you're going to be surprised. The media is going to be surprised by it. I don't think we're going to be as surprised uh, by that. Uh, but we've got some election uh, security issues to address even here in Pennsylvania, um, so that we don't have anybody's, um, no one's disenfranchised and we're not compromising our system or the integrity of our voting system. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before you go, there's a lot of comments in here. Just want to let you know, people are thanking you so much that I had you on as a guest. They've really enjoyed your thoughts, your views. It's really been much appreciated. And I think you're right about the, uh, the, the, the as uh, Dr. Victor Davis Hanson and I talked about earlier, the unseen, the unheard Trump voter that's secretly back there um, who's going to vote for Trump. Uh, I remember the last time at the election, I'd come back from Africa just, just prior to that election, and I watched that campaign, and I saw two Hillary Clinton signs the entire time. And all I saw was Trump everywhere. I went to the, to the Cumberland Valley High School where 15,000 people turned up to see Trump. And two days prior, two days prior to, well, I was there outside. I didn't get in. <laughs> but two, day, two days prior, um, Hillary Clinton had like 230 people show up in Harrisburg, you know, and it's, come on. Uh, this time I see a few more Joe Biden signs, but I still see the overwhelming thing. But I'll tell you that on that election, as I watched it, because it's kind of like a sport for me watching elections and returns, I predicted based on York County and looking at the numbers, if they held steady for what Trump was getting as the numbers came in, because York County was slow to report his results, that at 9.35 that evening, I called the race for Donald Trump because he'd already secured Florida, which is critical. And if he took Pennsylvania, he was going to win it. So at 9.35, I called the race for Donald Trump. Uh, it wasn't until 2.52 in the morning that the networks finally agreed with me. But uh, I will be live streaming the election this year. And uh, hopefully by, by, by 8.30, I can call it for Trump. <laughs> Uh, hey, that sounds good. I hope you can. Uh, Governor Wolf wants it to be three days after the election, so we'll see. Yeah, well, he probably wants it to be next year after we have the fraudulent right. mail-in ballots counted. But anyway, well, Representative Keeper, yep. thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll invite you to come back on the channel, perhaps after the election, and we can talk about more issues and where we're headed uh, with this uh, pandemic hysteria and governance here in Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for your time. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right, my pleasure. All right, I'm going to drop off there. See you. Okay, take care. All right, bye. All right, folks, that was uh, State Representative Dawn Kiefer from Pennsylvania's 92nd Congressional District. My representative, uh, first time ever I've actually talked to my own elected representative. That was pretty cool. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it immensely. She was a fantastic guest. I really like her outlook on life. And um, I didn't bring this up, but I said, you know, people have asked me about running for politics. And I said, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I've, this is my state representative. What am I going to argue with? You know, I can't run against her. I, we pretty much agree on most things. So it would be foolish to run against her. And then at the at the national level, Scott Perry is the uh, member of Congress for this district. And I agree pretty much with everything he says. So what am I going to run against him? And then at the state Senate level, we have Mike Regan. And I pretty much agree with everything he says. So I guess I could run for dog catcher or local water official. Maybe I could do that. But beyond that, I'm not really sure what it is I'd be running for office. Uh, as long as we got these fine legislators in place to make life better. I have to tell you what I like most about what uh, Representative Kiefer had to say is that she agrees with me that her position is to limit the role of government, not to expand it. And that's something that's always disturbed me when I see politicians crow about, well, oh, I had 42 bills I sponsored. Well, congratulations to you for impinging on our freedoms and narrowing our choices in life by restricting the things we can do by creating new laws that limit our freedom and liberty. Anyway, but uh, obviously Representative Kiefer doesn't agree with that philosophy, nor do I. So this was fantastic, folks. Um, I think that, uh, so uh, Erica says, nice Representative Chris, she reminds me of my lawyer. Okay, well, but she's not a lawyer, so I hope that's not in a bad way that she reminds you of your lawyer, <laughs> Erica. But uh, yeah, so she was fantastic, guys. I really uh, did enjoy uh, Representative Kiefer. So it was great to have her on. She was, uh, hopefully we'll get her back at some point. But uh, yeah, that was fantastic. So let me get to the chat really quick and close out with some chat comments here. By the way, Croy, okay, uh, just for clarity's sake, because I can't get everything out. I don't disagree with you. There are benefits. Why is my screen not looking right there? Oh, I got to go back to full screen. There are benefits to uh, to CBD and um, cannabis does have... Uh, has positive uh, medicinal benefits. Don't disagree with that at all. No, no, no. It's a per permissive 
permissive culture that comes with marijuana, weed, and the behavior that comes with it. And there are there are ill consequences of it. So yeah, maybe we'll have a show on that at some point, since that seems to be a topic. Uh, people are either in favor or against it. Uh, my position's more nuanced. I don't like the permissive attitude of the use of drugs. Um, yeah, I also don't like the permissive attitude towards the use of alcohol. I'm not a teetotaler. I'm not against drinking. Uh, I had a beer the other night. Uh, but um, it's it's the abuse of these things that's concerning. So anyway, so uh, hopefully nobody ganged up on Croy. I appreciate the question, and that's why I brought it in and asked Representative Kiefer about it, because I don't really know the status. It's not part of my personal culture, marijuana. So I thought it was for medicinal use here in Pennsylvania. It turns out that is the case. But uh, anyway, so uh, hopefully you're still there. Um, are you still there, Croy? I hope you didn't take off on us. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, hopefully um, shirts are called hemp in Afrikaans to this day because the product wasn't always illegal. Uh, well, yeah, hemp is used to make rope, all sorts of things. So yeah, it's 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 a nuanced position, I think. Let's see if there's any any important chat here I didn't miss. Corey says it didn't say there weren't health benefit problems with it, just thinking benefits is a way to generate local, local government revenue. Yeah, no, okay, I that's I don't disagree with you there. I think that you said something about Colorado and said there weren't any. It's it's been all pause in Colorado. I would disagree with that. I've been to Colorado and I've been assaulted by the, the vile stench of people smoking marijuana in the streets, which they're not supposed to be doing because once they can smoke it, they just get away with it. So. Uh, yeah, but uh, we could maybe have a program on that. I'll have to get somebody that's an expert on here, and we'll see what happens. Um, did he leave? I don't see him responding. Now I feel like Croy left. I hope he didn't leave Croy. Anyway, folks, uh, thank you so much for watching this stream. I'm going to drop off here in just a moment, and uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. I'll do a night out. I keep getting a phone call from these telemarketers here. Uh, I will uh, do a Night Owls edition tonight, and I'll bring you more information, more videos from my trip to Wyoming. So if you want to see that, you should see some cool videos coming up tonight on Chris White Africa, the uh, Night Owls version of Stray Voltage. Anyway, uh, Top Secrets, answer Croy's questions, okay? Uh, Top Secrets says, I'm your Candace expert, self-declared. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> I apologize for the, um, I don't know what the flushing sound was in the microphone. It must have been something with connection her in because we're not getting it now. But uh, it was uh, nonetheless a still good stream. I want to thank you all for tuning in and uh, tune in a little bit later for the Night Owl edition. I've got to catch up and get some work done. But thank you very much. Andre, your email. Uh, I saw your email, Andre, but um, I came home the night before, got to bed at two o'clock in the morning, got up. Did live streams yesterday, uh, lied down, laid down at about 6 p.m., woke up at midnight, fell back asleep, got up this morning, had to prep for Dr. Victor Davis Hanson. So I've got nothing accomplished other than picking up my post yesterday. And I still even to go grocery shopping, haven't had time to do that. So, uh, yes, Andre, I saw that and I will get back now. Now, what I didn't see is if his address was included in your email, Andre. Uh, if it was, then then I'll be able to contact him. But uh, anyway, thank you for that. All right, folks. Um, Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Uh, Lynn, are you just getting here? It says you're saying hello. <laughs> uh, well, by the way, folks, uh, in case you haven't heard, um, the Iranians have threatened to assassinate. They're going to assassinate the ambassador Alana Marks in South Africa. So um, we'll see what happens there. Donald Trump has promised to return to them 1,000 times anything they do to us. So I don't know if that will prove a deterrent for those uh, fascist, uh, theolo theological, theological fascists in Tehran. We shall see. All right, folks, uh, I'm going to tune off. I want to catch a little bit of Ronaldo Ho's program. He should be on now as I haven't seen him in over a week. And uh, I want to thank you for your time and for watching the show. God bless. And we'll see you a little bit later on. If you can tune in tonight, it'll be back at the normal time at 935 in South Africa, 335 Eastern Standard Time for the Night Owls edition, the Night Shift. All right, folks, thanks a lot. Um, cool beans. Here we go.